Okay, thank you, Oslem. Um, well, uh, for those who were in my session this morning, uh, if you didn't get what I was trying to say by listening to Eckhart, I'm sure you got it the second time. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about the same thing as this morning. I'm going to focus on profit inflation. And uh, whereas... Uh, uh, Serva Storm criticized, uh, made an external criticism, if you want, criticizing New Keynesians. I'm going to remain uh, broadly within uh, post Keynesian economics and the arguments that have been made uh, recently. Um, well, a lot of uh, left wing economists and uh, post Keynesian economists have argued that. Once we took into account the supply side shock, uh, the rise in the price of oil and all that, that the key culprit for the rise in inflation has been an increase in profit margin. So not all. Uh, there's a paper by Vernengo and Perez Caldente that uh, say the opposite. But it's not only the heterodox uh, economists who have talked or looked at the possibility of profit inflation. It has become quite fashionable, first among politicians, because then <laughs> they can't, they say it's not because we have increased the deficit that there is uh, inflation, um, but also by uh, central bankers who can also say, well, it's not because we have pursued quantitative easing that there is inflation. So you have a list of all these institutions which have also looked at profit inflation. And my own interest came from the fact that I was on the advisory committee of a student of my colleague, Mario Sakareccia, who uh, had one chapter of his thesis devoted to this issue of profit inflation. And I had to read it in November 2022 when I was sitting on a beach in Mexico, so I was forced to read his uh, chapter instead of enjoying the sea and the sun. <laughs> so I, 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 got, I got a bit annoyed. <laughs> uh, well, you, again, the paper in Roque by uh, Isabella Weber and her co-author has, uh, has, has made quite an impact. And her argument is basically that if everybody is talking about inflation, then it's much easier for firms to uh, raise prices or raise their profit margins. And in fact, this has been um, confirmed to me by a, a friend of mine who is a tennis player, but also a businessman. And uh, he, uh, he says that, yeah, now that he he raises the prices of his products and nobody is asking questions. So there, there must be some truth in that main claim. In fact, uh, the claim has been made back in 1983 by uh, somebody called Bird. It was published in the Cambridge Journal of Economics. And uh, essentially, he says exactly what uh, Isabella Weber is saying. And I, I looking at the... Uh, passage uh, in, uh, en gras, uh, in bold. Consequently, large publicized cost increases provide an opportunity for firms to increase their markups or to restore the effects of previous erosion. And I think it applies very well to uh, the current situation because there are some uh, studies that show that there was an erosion of markups at, in the early, early part of the COVID and then a catch up. Uh, so this idea of the profit inflation being generated by all the publicity around inflation uh, has some uh, history in post Keynesian economics. Okay, so what is going to be my, my outline? Uh, I'm going to try to uh, argue that, well, uh, maybe pro 
maybe profit inflation uh, did not really occur. I'm going to mention so the the fact that there was a, when it was discussed there was a, an omission of overhead labor cost, there was an omission of imported intermediate goods, and there were also other features that complexified the issue. And then I'll end up with two slides that will be my concluding uh, remarks. Uh, which are a bit unrelated to the rest of the presentation. Okay, I start with the omission of overhead uh, costs. Uh, that's the standard uh, profit uh, view of inflation. Um, but the overhead costs are not uh, really there. I mean, there's the assumption that the price is equal to a markup over unit labor cost, but um, there, there is no distinction between unit direct labor cost and overhead cost. And uh, as you can see at the bottom, uh, some people compute the profit share as indicated, uh, or some markup proxy, which would just be the ratio of the price to the unit labor cost. But there's a lot of confusion, at least, at, and especially so at the beginning of the debate. Uh, some people were saying there is a profit inflation because we have, uh, because profits have gone up. Sometimes people say so because the prof profit share has gone up or the price to unit labor cost are, have, has gone up. To me, the, the, tr the true measure, if we are to talk about profit inflation, we should be looking at the percentage markup, or uh, which is also called the costing margin. Uh, well, that's the way the Fred Lee uh, was calling it. And then we have these different types of uh, labor costs that we have to take into consideration. So there are two problems with using the price over unit labor cost or the profit share as a variable measuring profit inflation. So here I focus on the first one. The first problem is that because of the existence of overhead labor costs, the unit labor cost will vary endogenously with the level of output and the rate of capacity utilization. So all of the things being equal, the unit labor cost will fall with a rise in the rate of utilization. And hence the profit share will rise while the wage share goes down, giving the illusion that the percentage markup has risen. So even if the percentage markup is constant, you get this effect. So firms do not set prices on the basis of unit cost. They set them as a function either of the unit direct cost or as a function of the normal unit cost. Uh, so this is important to take that into account. Now, this is a graph taken from chapter three of my book. And what it shows is that even if you keep the markup constant, Automatically, if you have an increase in the rate of utilization or in the level of output, there will be a rise in the amount of profits, which are given by the cross area. And the inc there is an increase both because there is a higher level of outputs, so the, uh, and secondly, because uh, the average profit per unit will be bigger when uh, the level of output is larger, the rate of utilization is larger. So this thing here, this graph illustrates exactly this uh, figure. And this is the way that uh, most uh, people who look at, you know, do surveys of uh, what uh, the managers of firms uh, see cost, uh, cost, unit cost. Uh, so this is the proper representation of uh, unit cost and not the one which is be being given in neoclassical textbooks. Here is a, a graph taken from uh, Kutz and Norman in their chapter 
in a book of 2013 that was edited by Jeffrey Harcourt and Peter Chrysler. And you can see uh, that there is a difference between what I call the net costing margin on the one hand, who, which through the cycle remains roughly the same, and the actual net profit margin. So when we are at the top of the business cycle, the net profit margin, everything else being uh, more or less the same, will be much bigger than when we are at the bottom of the business cycle, when, where the uh, actual unit cost will be very close to the price level. And so you could say, well, uh, in 2022, when the economy picked up, well, we were at the top of the cycle, and when things were going bad in uh, the second quarter of 2020, uh, we were at the true of the cycle, and therefore the uh, net profit margin was very small at that time. And, uh, well, as, as you all know, there was a huge fall in the rate of capacity utilization in 2020, and this illustrates it uh, pretty well. And if we look at the labor share, uh, I, I, I am Canadian, so I'm, I'm more aware of Canadian data. Uh, you can see that during the, the COVID, there was a huge increase in the wage share. Uh, it went up, I think, to 64% of uh, national income, whereas before it was more like 56%. Uh, and you can see that whenever there is a recession or a slowdown, there is an increase in the wage share. So it's not surprising that when the economy picked up after the COVID crisis, that uh, there was uh, an increase in the profit share. Uh, so that's the first uh, component. And then there is the second component, which is the omission of imported raw materials. Uh, so that's the second problem. So labor costs are not the only costs faced by firms. Firms also face material costs, in particular the cost of intermediate goods. And when we're talking about at the national level, so it, at the national level, it would only be imported materials. Uh, so the unit direct cost of a firm would be equal to its, the unit direct labor cost, but plus the unit material cost. So if the unit material cost rises faster than the unit direct labor cost, as was explained, uh, by Eckhart, an increase in the ratio of the price to the unit direct labor cost or the price to the unit labor cost will give the illusion that the markup has risen. So um, we can see this uh, mathematically, well, simple equations where, uh, again, the price is 1 plus a percentage markup N over all these various uh, unit direct costs. And then we have J, uh, which stands for the ratio between the unit material cost relative to the unit direct labor cost. And if J, if J becomes bigger, then this will be another element driving up the rate of inflation. So you can see it in the P, P hat stands for the rate of price inflation, and we have this additional item, which is J hat. And as a consequence of that, sorry for the students who uh, look, uh, listen to me at 1 p.m., uh, the consequence of that is that if you increase J, so the, the relative importance of unit material cost relative to unit direct labor costs, then what will happen is that the profit share will go up as indicated there. And so obviously the real wage will also go down as is indicated here. Um, 
A number of studies have been based on the cost of goods sold, COGS, which, at least in theory, only takes into account direct labor and material cost. So this ought to be the, the best measure of the evolution of the markup, and my understanding is that in different ways this is the case of these uh, authors, uh, including Servas Storm, and also a Statistics Canada, so they, they try to use the cost of goods sold, which in my opinion is the best measure to try to assess the change in uh, percentage markup. Uh, the problem is that some of these assume the existence of a Cobb Douglas production function. So instead of having this flat marginal cost curve, they assume a rising marginal cost curve. They have counter cyclical markups, which is uh, opposite to uh, what we know. And hence, some, at least their, their results are puzzling and potentially not fully uh, reliable from a post-Kindian standpoint. Uh, for most countries, they find some increase in the markup when they compare 2019 to 2022. If I try to summarize in one sentence all of these studies and also others which I didn't list. Uh, Servas has uh, provided a, a graph in one of his, uh, well, in his study on, on these things. So he has the profit markup, and you can see it from his graph that indeed, uh, starting in 2020 second quarter, it jumps up and then remains high and then even increases a little bit. But my question, but I hope one of you will ask Servas, why does he start from the second quarter of 2020 when we know that the profit share went down and the wage share went up? Why, why not start from uh, the previous year, 2019? Um, so that's my uh, worry. Okay, I move on now to uh, some complexities uh, in, in this whole story about profit inflation. So there's been alternative definitions of profit inflation. Uh, Nikki Foros and Groff in, uh, in a blog uh, published on INET argued that if individual firms try to push back on workers an increase in the cost of important materials, there would be profit inflation. So they call this cost push profit led inflation. Sarah's uh, storm says something a bit similar, but not as affirmative. So uh, for Nikiforos and Groff, we can say that profit inflation is then redefined as a situation where firms refuse to see a fall in their costing margins. Personally, I don't feel at ease with this uh, redefinition. Okay, I move, now, I move on now to the issue of heterogeneity of firms. So I have three different kinds of heterogeneity. Uh, one is quite obvious, which is that when we compute aggregate profit margins, we have to realize that some firms have uh, operated in sectors the prices of which are determined on world markets. I mean, you know, these firms producing natural gas or oil or even some sorts of foods. So these prices have rose, risen quite a lot. And uh, in fact, in the study of Statistics Canada on this issue, they argue that some evidence has shown that profits and profit margins have risen but much of that has been in the oil and gas extraction, mining and acquiring petroleum and coal product manufacturing sectors. And I, I protected myself in my blog in 2023 when I said, while one can certainly acknowledge that some industries, such as the oil industry, have benefited from higher profit margins, as explained by David McDonald, who had done a study for Canada. So I, re I do recognize that in those industries, yes, there surely must have been an increase in the percentage markup. And food prices are also 
in this thing. So here is a study by, at, by people at the Bank of Canada, and it illustrates very well this first heterogeneity. If you look only at the blue line, this blue line takes into account all non-financial firms. So it includes uh, petroleum industry, the natural gas industry in Canada. And you can see, indeed, starting in 2020, 2021, 20, you, you can see a, a big increase in the uh, aggregate markup. Now, again, the, the, the computations they have is, is based on the neoclassical production function, but five. five. Okay. But uh, Oh, lucky. <laughs> okay, but, but if, you, if you look at the consumer goods, retail, if, if you wholesale and manufacturing, then at least in Canada, the, the, the percentage markup went up before 2020. And between 20 and 2022, it hardly moves. So that's the first. The second heterogeneity is one argued by Joseph Steindl and more recently in a paper by Olivier Alain, which is the fact that all firms were not created equal. So as was pointed out before, uh, some firms are more uh, efficient than others. And so the firms that had low uh, profit margins uh, are likely to have gone bankrupt during the, the COVID. So there's a statement here also by Statistics Canada saying aggregate markups could be driven by the exit of low markup firms or the reallocation of market share to firms with higher markups. So that's another possibility to explain what has happened. Uh, Tom Ferguson and Servas Storm have argued that the richest 10% of households have powered the recovery of aggregate U.S. consumption expenditure. So rich households buy more luxury goods, and you would expect that those luxury goods have higher profit margins. And in fact, if you look at the kind of cars that you can buy today in North America, you can only buy luxury cars. I mean, the small cars are gone. You don't see any on the, in, the, in the parking lots of the, the sellers of, of cars. Uh, this point has also been made by uh, Mark Yarsulik, uh, who had disappeared from economics and reappeared uh, last year. Uh, he has this graph showing that uh, after the, the COVID, there was a big move of, of the consumers towards manufacturing uh, goods and commodities rather than going into services. The blue line is the services, and the red line is uh, all the uh, dura durable goods. Uh, what about uh, how should we measure uh, the profit? Should we measure it with or without inventory valuation adjustment? And so some people argue that we should not look at the, the measure with the IVA. Uh, and this is the case in particular of Isabella Weber. But the work I did uh, with uh, Wynne Godley, uh, I learned a lot writing the book with Wynne Godley. One thing I learned is that the share of profits reduced by the inventory valuation adjustment will correspond to the share of profits if there was no inflation. So in my view, that's the proper measure of the, the level of profits. This is a graph taken from Isabella Weber and her co-author. And you can see that in 19, the 1950s, you know that the rate of inflation was very high. The blue line is without the adjustment. The red line is with the adjustment. And, and if you look at the end in 2020, 2020 2022, uh, you can see again that without the adjustment, profits are, are very high. Uh, but I, I believe that the red line is the proper one to look at. OK, two concluding uh, remarks, uh, perhaps which will be uh, a bit uh, controversial. You know, uh, Servas talked about wage increases. 
Well, certainly uh, we want wages to catch up because it's quite obvious to everyone that uh, wage earners have had increases in their wages which were much lower than the increases in prices. However, in Canada, unit labor costs have risen by 5.1 and 6.8% in 2021 and 2022, uh, and they have also risen a lot uh, in the first half of 2023, uh, and they have also risen uh, by 6.2% in 2022 in the USA. So why is this so when wages have not caught up with um, with prices, the reason is that labor productivity in both countries has decreased in 2022 and keeps going down in the first half of 2023. So Steve Pressman is one that has uh, pointed, pointed this out in, in a blog. And yeah, it is a cause for worry. Uh, why has labor productivity gone down compared even to the situation before the COVID, before 2019. So that's the first thing. And my last remark, yes, is uh, how about profit inflation today? Well, there's a, a deputy governor of the Bank of Canada that has given his full support to the case of profit inflation. The, the bank is not to be blamed. The culprit is, are the firms who ch now change prices more frequently. And so this leads to an acceleration of inflation. But then one could answer, well, what ha what is, what's the consequence of that? If prices of uh, intermediary or imported um, products start going down, then this is good news because the firms <laughs> will adjust their prices faster than they used to do in the past and so this should help reducing uh, the the rate of the rate of growth of the consumer price index thank you that's all wonderful <laughs>